Right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining and for tuning in to Papaya's work on calculus. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we help you in your finals. And the reason why we wanted to put this workshop is because I was talking to my good friend, George, who has helped us um, in our first webinar, Believe in Yourself. I don't know if you were able to watch. But we wanted to be more proactive about people dropping out of engineering uh, degrees. And the reason why we put this workshop is because out of 300,000 uh, in a study uh, found uh, that 300,000 students, uh, a quarter of them failed to get a letter C or higher in calculus. And the results are that um, about half of them graduate with an engineering degree. So that's two, that's one in two who actually get um, to achieve their dreams. So we wanted to uh, we wanted to be a little more proactive and help you in your finals. So Papaya believes in inclusion and diversity. So we are partnered with SUI and we want to empower women as I'm one myself. And um, we talked to Allison who has been gracefully uh, able to host this event along with George. So they'll take the, they'll take the stage. Uh, just wanted to kind of go over the agenda. We have very exciting uh, topics. We have externship announcements. We have some raffles that we're gonna do at the end of the, the workshop. We also have, um, we're announcing our new ambassador. And, and yeah, we just wanna work with, you know, all minorities and we really wanna show what we bring to the table. So if we go on the next one. So yeah, looking for externship. So we're gonna talk about this later uh, during the break. And you know, this is um, a great opportunity to get your feet wet and to really know if you are going to, you know, to school for the right major. Uh, we can talk about this later. And then on the next slide, This is very exciting to me. Uh, so we met Alexis and through Instagram. We used to see that she was a STEM ambassador and an advocate as well for diversity and inclusion. She has, uh, she's a, a big advocate, so she's gonna represent us in the University of Memphis, Tennessee. And she is also very involved with all of the organizations that you see. So, so yeah, we're gonna be uh, putting all minorities together in STEM, which is very exciting to me. Um, Alexis, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything. I think she might have dropped by accident. Oh no, she's here. Yes, I can. I'm just happy that you're here. Can you all hear me? And I know you're taking calculus three, right? Okay, then she's having mic uh, issues, but yeah. So, well, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Allison, and I'm very excited to to work with her. She's the president of SWE. Um, yeah, so we talked about, you know, while we're putting this together. So, so yeah, I wanna introduce Allison, and, and I'm very excited that she's gonna host this event along with George. I, I believe in empowering one another, and very impressed with everything she does for the community at the Florida International University. Um, thank you, Sandra. Um, for some reason, I can't turn my video on, so um, I don't know. But uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity today. I'm here on behalf of SWE. My name is uh, Alison Martinez. I am actually a senior majoring in biomedical engineering at Florida International University, and I was actually born and raised in Honduras. So I'm an international student here. And I like to start by saying that they say that behind every successful woman, there is a tribe of other successful women who have their back. And this event is actually one of the perfect examples of what SWE uh, stands for. Um, SWE is proud to be hosting this event with, especially with a female startup company. 
and with the other collaborators here today. And we as an organization are invested in building an environment to empower women and also underrepresented minorities and not only in the engineering field, but also in STEM. And this particular event is about helping others. I like to say that we rise by lifting others and giving students the tools and workshops like this, for example, can help them thrive uh, within the professional field. And you might think that you don't need calculus at all, but this leads me to introduce a very special guest today, which is Mr. George Salazar, um, an engineer at NASA. And we have a couple of questions from the students at FIU regarding the, the mission with SpaceX. So, um, uh, so George, one of the questions that was popping the most from our FIU students is how does NASA interact with SpaceX? Well, hello, everybody. First of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, uh, uh, to support this. So, uh, I, I think it's a wonderful um, um, organization, you know, to help students. Uh, regarding the question, I think it's a great question. Uh, the collaboration with SpaceX is um, uh, very much, uh, you know, hand in hand uh, in ensuring that the um, astronauts, uh, in, in the case of human spaceflight, uh, are safely um, transported to um, to space station. Uh, so um, the way we work that is that, uh, you know, SpaceX is uh, doing a lot of the uh, hands-on design work, but uh, we have NASA engineers working with Na uh, with uh, SpaceX. So SpaceX had, I guess up to this point, very little um, experience related to uh, human spaceflight. Uh, there's something called human rating uh, of, a, of a spacecraft system that's very important for NASA, and there's a lot of steps that you got to go through uh, to get that human rating uh, certification. And of course, uh, Federal uh, Aviation Administration also is involved now because they're a commercial company. Again, SpaceX is now the first commercial company ever to supply a human rated spacecraft uh, to go to International Space Station. So the uh, collaboration is very close in terms of uh, reviewing designs, uh, uh, attending tests, uh, especially the human in the loop test uh, associated with uh, uh, the uh, astronauts uh, controlling the spacecraft. And then, you know, certainly the, the, the most important is uh, the, the launching of the spacecraft. Uh, there's a lot of people involved in that. And uh, even though you see on on the on the television, you know, just uh, maybe a, a room full of people. But rest assured that, like for example, Mission Control has somewhere in the vicinity of fifty to seventy-five people in the background, uh, including uh, where I work uh, in the launch facility, uh, or rather the the Mission Control Center. It's called the uh, Commercial Crew Systems um, Commercial Crew uh, Engineering Systems uh, 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 Room. And so we have a lot of the engineers that uh, work closely with SpaceX uh, to make sure this is a, uh, a successful flight. And uh, it's just a whole bunch of data. <laughs> it's just an incredible amount of data uh, to look at, you know, while the, the while the mission is going on, uh, making sure that the right calls are made uh, in the event of, uh, of issues associated with the uh, with the systems. And there's a lot of systems. Uh, on SpaceX and and so uh, SpaceX and NASA work very closely together, ensuring that you know first of all it's been certified properly, and then secondly it flies and meets the objectives uh, of the of the mission that uh, that we're signed up for. That's awesome. It's really nice to hear from a person who has um, really experienced that from insight from the inside. You know, it's really different and. Moving on to a second question, when it comes more to like um, the calculus principles and engineering principles, what have you heard about the struggles engineer students face when not having the right fundamentals? Like, for example, what are some of the challenges that you have faced personally uh, working with NASA as well and that you see that some students lack about it? Oh, well, I have to say that, okay, so uh, here's the thing. I mean, you know, a lot of the students out there are engineering majors. And, you know, for the most part, 99.99% of the uh, classes are all associated with uh, technical skills. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, it's, um, I have to say that uh, in the real world, you're, you're actually dealing with more people that, um, 
have that, that help make a project successful. So you can have a very good technical team, but if if nobody can work together because of personalities, egos, and things of that sort, a uh, project is considered a um, basically a failure. And so if you look at a lot of past projects, whether it's uh, space exploration or uh, even uh, oil and gas industry, a lot of the failed projects are not associated so much with the technical aspects, but with working with people. And so um, one of the challenges that I found was uh, actually, you know, the uh, the human element, working with humans uh, uh, as far as uh, the uh, the projects are concerned. So that's one of the challenges. Second challenge, uh, let's talk about a little bit about the technical aspect, because, you know, we're talking here uh, about, uh, you know, the calculus and its, uh, and its uh, use in, the, in the, whether it's uh, uh, engineering or, or different areas of, of the STEM field is, uh, you know, the technical, once a student graduates from an undergrad, let's say, for example, undergraduate in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering like myself, is um, you just basically have just scratched the surface of, uh, of uh, the um, uh, technical challenges that you have uh, up against you. And so, once you start working in the area that you you uh, you get a you get a job, whether it's NASA, whether it's the automotive industry, whether it's air, uh, aerospace uh, like Boeing or whatever, you're going to have to learn their their uh, let's call it the lingo of their of their technical languages. You're going to have to learn the tools that they use. You're going to have to learn their processes that they use. And, and a lot of this is not taught in school. And so the challenge is for you to be a very open-minded engineer and uh, basically learn how to uh, learn, if that makes any sense. In other words, you're gonna have to learn a lot of things, but you gotta know how to learn. And so two things that come into mind that I found very beneficial is one is that know who to ask, okay? Secondly, know where to look. Those are two critical aspects, even though they, they sound simplistic, but they're not. They're very important in, in your career. And so uh, this is something that I had to learn by the seat of my pants. And, and this is, I'm just sharing with you two simple ideas. Uh, and, and for these two ideas to work, you got to leave your ego behind. If you're a 4.0 uh, GPA uh, uh, um, Double E or whatever, uh, make sure that you uh, uh, review your ego and and, and, sh and make sure that that does not impede your learning process because you can be a 4.0 in electrical engineering, but I guarantee you when you start working, as I found out at NASA, you're, you're at the bottom of the pack. You're at the bottom of uh, you know learning. And so it's important to understand how to uh, uh, let, let's call it integrate into a into a uh, into a career and the and the way that I found is uh, first of all and most important is to have a good mentor and then that mentor should help you navigate uh, to the areas of know who to ask and know where to look for information because you don't know everything and uh, uh, that's something that. Uh, that uh, was a challenge for me at the very beginning, and I had to learn it uh, on the on the seat of my pants. And I'm here, I'm sharing it with you within, you know, within three or five minutes. But <laughs> it took me a, a few years to to learn that. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really nice to hear how you think that it is really important to have a support group, like I mentioned, like a good mentor people that support you, and like you got to look for answers. I feel like sometimes as an engineering student. You try to solve a problem and you don't stop to think about how are you going to actually apply this into your field. So thank you for the tips that you have provided, George, um, for the engineering student. So I think we can move on into our calculus workshop. I guess uh, George gave some tips. To unlock your full potential in the engineering school when he mentioned some of the things he had uh, today but if you have anything else to add feel free to do so george um, yeah, yeah sure so uh, first of all <laughs> um uh, you know the you know they we're talking about calculus so uh, i'm not sure you can see this but uh this was my calculus book for calculus one two and three uh it's called calculus and analytic geometry by george b thomas jr 
and uh, it it um, it's got duct tape on it because it was falling apart because I kept opening it and closing it and you know reviewing problems. Um, I have to say that uh, I was very weak in mathematics. Uh, I I I don't want to get into the long story, uh, the history of my. Uh, uh, high school background, but I was very weak in math. And, uh, and so in fact, I had to go to junior college before I go to university. Um, so I had to take uh, intermediate algebra and college algebra and something called elementary functions before I even take calculus. But I, one thing that I, 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 I struggled with initially when I moved over to engineering, because I first started out in technology, was that I was first trying to comp uh, compete with students that were very good in mathematics. And so, uh, uh, you know, I, and when the grades would come in for testing, I, you know, I, <laughs> I would find myself, you know, kind of at the lower bottom of the of the grades, and it was very disappointing. And, and but later, I just decided, you know what, I'm not going to compete with anybody. I'm going to do the best that I can, and 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 that, you know, what it, it is what it is. Okay. And so, but I said, you know what, if I'm going to do the best I can, I'm going to do everything in my power. To, uh, to, to get the best grade that I can. And so what I did, as far as tips are concerned, it wasn't just uh, calculus and, uh, and uh, differential equations and some of the higher mathematics associated with electromagnetics uh, was that, uh, okay, these students, you know, these students uh, obviously are very sharp and much sharper than I am. I, I got to work twice or three times as hard. So I just I, I just knew that I had to work harder. You know, the same thing as, uh, you know, for those of you who do running, if, uh, you know, if you're trying to, uh, you know, run a uh, under six minute mile or a under five minute mile, you're not going to do it by just uh, running a couple of times out of the week, you know, and, and maybe a couple of miles out of the week. Uh, to, you, you're going to have to keep practicing, 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 practicing. And, and so that's what I did. Every time I had a chance, I was studying problems. I would take a, I would take problems, um, solutions to problems that were given uh, after after we turned in our homework and found out all the mistakes that I made. Is I would work those problems over and over and over again till it, until it settled in. First of all, what did I do wrong? And then secondly, how can I approach the problem differently? And those were the things that uh, uh, come to mind right now as far as uh, studying tips, whether it's um, uh, calculus, whether it's um, mechanics, whether it's physics, um, whether it's electrical engineering, chemical engineering, or whatever, is that there's, uh, there's going to be some topics that just are foreign to you, and it's just very hard to comprehend. And one of the reasons sometimes it's hard to comprehend, unfortunately, is that you may have a professor that's very academic and teaches theoretical stuff that wants you to become a research engineer. A lot of us don't want to become research engineers. I didn't want to become a research engineer. I want to take engineering and apply it to developing systems. So, um, but you know, you got to deal with that. You got to deal with that. So, um, unless you have a great professor that worked in the industry and said, uh, I had a Cal 2, you know, I'm talking about calculus. I had a calculus 2 professor. A lot of students were dropping out of calculus 2. They were not making it. Even though I have to tell you, I had a, my, um, my uh, uh, brother-in-law scored 1,500 on an SAT, all right? 1,500 is not too shabby. He could not pass calculus 2, all right? And uh, and so there was uh, there were some other ones that just couldn't pass calculus too. Well, I uh, luckily I, I had an organization that shared with me uh, which professors had to take for calculus too, and I took a professor that was a practical engineering professor. He had worked at uh, applied physics lab in uh, out in Boston. He worked at uh, MIT in research labs. And so when he taught calculus too, he taught it from a practical standpoint. And so the practical standpoint was he gave us problems that were practical and not what he considered uh, mind exercisers. I'm not gonna say that you're gonna get that kind of professor. I was very fortunate to have a Cal 2 professor like that. Uh, Cal 3 was just the opposite, but be that as it may, I strolled and made it through there. But uh, it's uh, it's important to uh, to understand uh, you know where your limitations are, and and sign up to the fact that you're just going to have to work harder. 
And so uh, there's, a, there's a slogan or a motto that uh, I came across many years ago that, that's very true. It's uh, 10 two-syllable words in there that can be very powerful. And it's just like, it goes like this. If it is to be, it is up to me, right? So if you want to graduate, you know, it's going to be up to you, all right? Uh, and you're going to have to find that avenue to help you graduate, whether it's uh, studying, you know, three or four times as hard as anybody else, of uh, hiring um, uh, tutors like Papaya, you know, to help you. It's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's a matter of how much, uh, how, how much you want it. How, you know, how, how much is burning in your heart to make that happen? Wow, that's great advice, George. We appreciate it. So I think now it's a good time to do like a little segue to the actual, well, to the workshop. Um, I know that George, you can introduce our first, uh, our first uh, tutor. His name is Jeremy. So, and um, um, you guys, could, you guys on, especially the people on the YouTube live, um, you can stick around until the end because like we would like you to comment and there will be a raffle by the end so you can get free tutoring and a lot of papaya swag. So uh, we can go on with Jeremy. So I will drop my presentation and Jeremy can start presenting his uh, presentation on limits. So that's the first topic for today. Yes, thank you, Gabriel. Um, welcome all the students that just came in. I can see that there's a few of them that just uh, joined the chat. So thank you for joining in. We're starting the workshop strong. So uh, there you go. So, uh, can you see my presentation? Sorry? Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. So hi, my name is Jeremy. I am 23 years old and I am currently a senior at bioengineering at UTEC. I love to read horror novels and watch movies. So. Today, I'm going to do a quick overview about limits. First, let's talk about the concept of limits itself. So now, imagine that you are chilling at your sofa watching Netflix, and suddenly you get very, very hungry, OK? Then you remember that there is a hamburger at your kitchen. So you stand up, and you begin walking towards that hamburger, OK? In that moment, your mother appears, and she sees you going for that hamburger. And in that exact moment, she thinks that the limit of you when you are moving towards your kitchen is that hamburger, OK? So that is a simple concept of limits, you being the function and the hamburger being the number that you are approaching, OK? It doesn't really matter if you actually catch your hamburger, OK? What matters is that you are approaching and you are very, very close to that hamburger, which is the number, OK? Now, when we want to calculate the limit, you first need to take to start with a simple step, direct sub substitution. You plug in the number of the limit, and then you can get three answers from there, OK? First, you can get a really a real simple number. When that happens, you basically uh, finish the whole problem okay in your exam normally that doesn't happen <laughs> sadly so the other possibility is that you get a division where the denominator is zero that if you graph that function it will give you an asymptote okay and the last possibility and the most common one is that in the terminate form when you have a division where the where is zero under zero you cannot have this answer because it basically doesn't exist, OK? So when this happens, what you want to do is you want to rewrite the limit through factoring, conjugation, or trigonometry identity. After that, normally you can plug in the limit number again, and you will, ha you will get a real number, OK? Sometimes uh, when that doesn't happen, when you simply don't get the answer, you can always get it through the graph of the function, of the function, OK? So you can graph the function and evaluate each number until you obtain the limit number, OK? So now I'm going to talk about limit loss. 
Liminals are really, really simple. Okay, let's start with the first one, the sum. When you have the limit of, of the sum of two functions, you can separate that limit. Okay, let's see here. Uh, when you have the, the limit of 4x plus 5x, you can separate that limit with limit of 4, 4x plus limit of 5x. And the answer will be the same. Is uh, it's again with difference is the same. You know, when you have the the limit of the difference of two separate functions, you can separate the, that limit. Okay. Here you can separate this function to the limit of 9x minus the limit of x divided by 4, and you will have the normal answer. When you have a constant you what you can do is to extract that constant from the limit okay what you can do is uh, it doesn't matter what type of concept constant it is it could be 50 it could be 2.4 or it could be um like a square root of minus one it doesn't really matter what type of constant it is okay what matters is that you can extract that constant from your limit and you can uh, proceed to change the limit by the limit number and you get your answer. Okay, now let's go for the, the next. So oh, the, the product. When you have the product of two separate functions, you can, uh, you can separate that, that limit, the same as the, the sum. You know, when you have the limit of sine of x multiplied by the cosine of x you will have you will get the limit of sine of x multiplied that by the limit of cosine of x and you will have the answer is the same with coaching okay like here you can see that there is two different functions here in this division okay so what you can do is just say that each of the parts of the division has a limit and then you can um, swap the the um, the variable by the limit number and you will get your answer now with power and um, with the root it's the same okay you get that root or you get that power and you extract it from the limit right and you swap the number or the limit number inside of the root or inside the power and then you uh, you you take into consideration that power now let's talk a little bit about a simple simple really simple problem okay here we have the limit of u going towards 2 uh, of 4u plus 1 square root all minus 3 divided by 2 my by u minus two okay so first as always you need to pull you need to plug the num the number the limit number okay so you swap the number and as you can see we get zero under zero so this is the indeterminate form that we talked about um before this is what you don't want to have okay so here, as you can see, there is a square root. So when you have the square root, you usually conjugate the whole equation, okay? So for this, you, we need to remember this property, okay? So you have this function where there is the square root and you multiply it by a similar function. So you can, uh, this first part of the function, you can, power it by two, so the square root is gone, okay? So we do that, we multiply this part and we multiply the denominator and we will have this. After this, we operate the plus one minus nine and we will have this, four u minus eight, okay? Now, as you can see, we almost have the full answer. Now you factorize the four, so you can have four might multiply it by u minus two. And what you do is you just 
eliminate the u minus 2 in the upper part and in the lower part of the division, OK? And you will have the, the answer of the whole problem, OK? You now, after you conjugate the equation, you uh, swap again the number and you operate it, being the final answer 4 divided by 6, OK? Now, let's go with a different problem, OK? What is the answer of the limit of x going towards infinity positive of 3x minus 1, all of that multiplied by 4x minus 2, divided by x plus 8, multiplied by x minus 1? OK, so first, uh, when when you have that um, that infinity, you normally cannot uh, plug in the number since it, it is infinity. OK, so first you start by simplifying the equation. You just multiply these two functions here and these two functions here. You multiply them and then what you do, what you need to do, this is a little trick, all right? What you need to do is that you need to divide the function with the x that has the biggest exponential, all right? In this case, is x power by 2, OK? So you divide the whole function by that exponent. So now that we have this function, now we divided everything by x uh, power by 2. And we will have the limit of x going to uh, infinity positive of 12 minus 10 divided by x plus 2 divided by x um, power by 2. And in the denominator, we will have 1 plus 9 divided by x minus x minus 8 divided by x power by 2. And now, remember, when x is going towards uh, positive infinity, then when you have a number divided by x or positive infinity, it will go towards zero. It will the limit of that division will be basically zero. Okay. So now you swap the whole x, all of this, all of the x by infinity, and you divide. All right. You you will have now twelve minus zero plus zero. And in the denominator, you will have 1 plus 0 minus 0. That the final answer will be 12. Okay. And now I am give you, I am going to uh, end and give you the word the word with Anna Maria. All right. Hi guys. So I'm going to present right now. Uh yeah. Okay, can everyone see? Yeah, great. Okay, hi, I'm Ana Maria Perez. I'm majoring in mechatronics engineering at Utec University in Lima, Peru. I, one of my hobbies is painting. Uh, I, and I also played varsity basketball at school, which actually allowed me to participate in a South American competition representing Peru, which was really cool. And now I'm going to kind of explain a little bit about derivatives. OK, so we're going to go through our theory, a little bit of strategy about how solving problems. And then a big problem that I encountered in one of my practice exams in college. OK, so first theory. So uh, I'm a pretty visual person, so I'll, I'm always trying to find graphs and things to, to kind of understand math. So I also found this kind of a representation of how derivatives work and I'd like for all of you to see it so as you can see um, derivatives basically what they do is they explain how the slope of the tangent in a function is changing so as you can see whenever the slope is kind the tangent it's kind of vertical excuse me or horizontal you can see that in the function of the derivative, that is this one, it's zero. And it happens uh, in a lot of times in every, fun in every function, in almost every function. So let's go back to the, to the slides. 
So as I said, here you can see how in V, in both times, when the tangent is horizontal, the derivative is zero, explaining that uh, the derivative describes the changes in the slope of the tangent at every moment in the, in the function. So let's go throughout the strategy. Okay, so these are basic properties and rules that kind of describe uh, the relationships inside the functions and how to solve uh, these relationships accordingly. We also have some common functions such as trigonometric functions, uh, exponential logarithmic functions, and how to, to solve them. Okay, so we're gonna go through this easy problem uh, and you'll see throughout solving different derivatives um, that the most interesting kind of large problems are just common functions are related throughout the chain rule, throughout the product rule or, or others. So a great hack is just trying to find these common functions and try to solve them kind of individually. So that's what we're going to do right now. Okay, as we can see, kind of the main element of this function is the sine. Therefore, uh, it's a kind of trigonom it's a trigonometric function. We we can also see that, and the trigonometric function is solved by the, by by this derivative. We can also see that inside the sine there is a natural logarithmic, which is a logarithmic function uh, that it's solved this way. So you can see that there's there are like just common functions that we always encounter, but they are related amongst each other in this kind of bigger function. We can also see that this logarithmic function is added by, uh, to an exponential function that is also within the sign, and it is solved this way. And they are all related throughout the chain rule. The chain rule basically says that there's a function within a function, which is basically what we're seeing right here. So let's see how to solve it. Okay, so here we have our function, and uh, the chain rule basically says that when there's a function within the function, you uh, derivate the kind of bigger function and outer function, and uh, keep whatever is inside the same, and you multiply it by the derivative of whatever is inside. So we have like these two big elements, or two principal elements, so let's kind of identify them separately, and then uh, solve it. Okay, so we have the uh, outer function, which in our case will be h, and it's uh, as the sign of gx when gx would be our inner function. So we, here we have gx, our inner function, and here it's the logarithmic of 4x plus uh, e to the power of negative 2x. So first, let's first solve this, uh, the outer function. As you can see uh, from our common functions, the derivative of a sine is just the cosine. And since everything inside needs to remain the same, we just keep gx the same. Okay, so now we just replace gx for its value. And here we have already our first element of the derivative. Okay, the next step would be derivating whatever it's inside the, the, general, the general function. So let's derivate it. Okay, so as you can see, this, this function is just two, fun two little functions added together. So one of our rules or properties of derivatives is that when you derivate um, two functions or more that are being added or subtracted together, it's the same as derivating each one individually. So that's what we're going to do. So first we're going to derivate the natural logarithmic. So by uh, our list of common functions of natural, natural logarithmic, we can see that uh, the derivative of a natural logarithmic is the derivative of whatever is inside as a numerator, and you just keep it the same as the denominator. So now we go to our second little function. So plus the derivative of e to the power of negative 2x. Okay. So we can see that this is how to solve, you know, an exponential function. So we kind of just do that. Uh, we put the derivative of the ex exponent here and we just keep everything the same. That's how you solve that common function. 
So just simplifying everything, you know, getting rid of the force and multiplying plus uh, by negative, you have negative, and you already have these two elements of our derivative. So uh, the only thing we have, we're left to do is just multiply them, and here we have our solution. So as you can see, it's just kind of trying to find this little common uh, functions, see how they are related by the chain rule, by the product rule, by the quotient rule. There are different rules and properties, and just kind of you know go through there. And as uh, as you practice more and more, you're just gonna spot this these rules and and relationships immediately immediately, and you're going to be able to just solve them. Okay, so we're gonna go. Uh, and try a kind of harder exercise. This one I had in one of my exams, one of my practice ex exams, actually, the, the principal, you know, bigger exams are way longer and, yeah, more, way more exhausting to, to solve. Okay, so I try to find a problem that has to do a lot about changes in time, which is one of the main uses of derivatives. So here we have a system, a piston cylinder system, which consists, uh, which has um, a crank, and the crank is moving the cylinder, the piston, uh, left and right. So, uh, and it's moving with an angular velocity of 0 0.85 radians per second, and the piston has a four centimeter radius. So, what the problem is asking from us is to find the rate of volume change of the cylinder when alpha, which is the angular position, is pi over two. Okay, so let's see our considerations and basically how we solve this kind of problem. Okay, so we have to see what's changing inside the volume of the piston, of the cylinder. As you can see, the area of the piston actually stays constant. So, what, so the only thing that actually changes in time in the cylinder is this h, which is the length. Here we also have the volume of a regular cylinder, uh, where here the area would, would be maintaining constant throughout time. We can also see that h is kind of related. You, the change in time of h is related to the change in time of, of x. So that's going to help us a lot, a lot. But we also need to um, get in mind that when x uh, decreases, h increases. So they're actually related by when h is positive, x is negative, basically. So another interesting property is the, the angular velocity is the derivative of the angular position. So let's go ahead and solve our problem. OK, so here we have uh, the, this is what they are asking us, the change of volume in time. And since this basically is, is a constant, it's, uh, as we said, the area keeps constant in time. It just, it's not der derivated. And the only thing that we are derivating or the only thing that we actually need to find is this value. Okay, so the only data that they actually gave us that has anything to do with changes in time is the angular velocity. So we need to find uh, an equation or a function that kind of relates this x with the angular velocity. So that's when the law of cosines comes into consideration. So just applying this law of cosines, because it has you know, the x and the, and the angle, applying this law of cosines to our own triangle, we have this equation. Now, in this equation, we can see x, and we can see alpha, and we have all of the values that we actually need. But the, what we need to find is this, which is the derivative of x. So let's just go ahead and der derivate the whole equation. OK. So one of the properties that we saw before is that when you derivate equation, uh, functions that are uh, added or subtracted, you need to kind of derivate them individually. So that's what we're going to do with each one of these. OK. So now let's go ahead and see how this get derivated. So let's have these properties in mind. When you derivate a constant, uh, the result is 0. Therefore, these two are 0. When you derivate this kind of function, you have to kind of put the exponent down and subtract 1 from the exponent. So we're basically left with this. One of the other properties is that when you are derivating 
a function that is being multiplied by a coefficient that it's constant, it can go out of the derivation. So we are left with this. Uh, let's see something that we can maybe subtract from the equation to make it easier. Let's see, we can erase these twos. And yeah, um, well, the zero. So let's go ahead and keep solving it. So we are left with this, with this equation. This is already derivated, but we need to derivate this part. Okay, so the product rule, which is basically how these two kind of little functions are related, says that uh, when you derivate uh, two functions that are being multiplied, the result is the derivation of the first one by the second one plus the first one by the derivation of the second one. So that's what we're going to do. As we can see, the derivation of the first one, that it's x, would be 1, which is here. And the second one just stays the same, which is cosine of alpha. Since the, since the value that we de derivated is it's x, we here need to put the derivative x over it uh, in time. So it would be plus the first, the first kind of function, it, it stays the same, and the derivative of the second one. In this case, the derivative of sine, of cosine, excuse me, is the negative sine of alpha. Since the function that we derivated is this one, we have to put the derivative of alpha in time. So there we have it. The only thing left to do, since we already got the value that we needed, which is the derivative of x in time, is to factorize it. Okay, so factorizing it, you know, uh, putting everything to the left, to the right, and kind of make it, a, make it a so we can understand, we are end up with this function. Okay, so we already have this that we needed, and we have to take in mind that this was already given to us by the problem, and, al and also alpha. Okay, so alpha being pi over two, and the angular velocity that is the same as the derivation of the angular position is 0 0.8 pi radians per second. We can uh, replace these values in our function. So the sine of pi over two is one. So this just gives the same, so one goes here. And also the the cosine of pi over two is zero. So this whole value here, you know, pi. Okay, so uh, the great thing about this problem is that it, it puts us in a position that we can actually eliminate these two x. You know, one here and one here. And so this negative goes and affects the whole kind of numbers and makes 5.58 a negative. So one of the things that you have to keep in mind, it's happened to me a lot, that in exams, you don't really take in mind of putting uh, your calculator in radians, configuration in, in radians. So it's like you have everything done, but then you put your numbers in your calculator and it's not in radians and the number just isn't right. So just keep that in mind. So, okay, so just multiplying our two numbers that we have left, we have that the change of x in time is negative 14.02 centimeters per second. Okay. So, but they are not asking for the change of x in time. They are asking for the change of volume, volume in time. So we already have all the, all the kind of values. So we'll just have to replace them. So we are kept with this uh, function. So further analyzing it and getting, getting those numbers in the calculator, we have that the, that the change of the volume in time equals 704.72 cubic centimeters per second. You also have to take in mind that you also, you have to put the units. You know, some professors let it slide and don't take points away from you, but as an engineering, as an, as a, you know, it's a good practice to kind of have those units there because as you get more into college, you'll see that you have to work with a lot of different kind of types of unities and types of quantities and having your units there helps a lot. Okay, so now responding to the question that was presented, what is the rate of volume change of the cylinder when alpha is pi over two? So the rate of volume change is 704.72 cubic centimeters per second. And um, yeah, that's everything. We already solved the kind of big problem. As, and as you can see, the part of derivating, it's not actually the kind of hardest or more interesting part, 
but it's actually finding the function that or equation that you need to ne derivate. So here practice comes a long way. Uh, this way you can see different systems and different kinds of problems and actually mm, and practice how to connect all the previous knowledge about ge geometry or maybe a little bit of physics into math problems. So that's everything for me. Thank you. And here now we go to, to one of my uh, to another one of my friends and he'll explain another subject. Uh, okay, well, George, uh, be, before we uh, yeah, before we go uh, any further, I just want to make a, a couple of comments. Uh, you know, Jeremy and uh, Ama Maria, uh, great presentation, a lot of good information. So uh, I want to ask you both because there's something that just came across with your uh, explaining of this that uh, I'm reminded of some of my uh, former college students that struggled with. If you're not strong in algebra, it can be very challenging to do calculus. Is that a correct statement? Mm, not not really, you know, like the simple kind of problems, but the one that comes with context and they also, they, uh, a lot of them require a lot of previous knowledge of other subjects from you. So uh, one of the things I like to do is I, it's hard for me to kind of study or practice on my own, but in college I had this, they, they have the system that there is um, kind of older student that likes to solve uh, hard problems, problems with context in kind of classes. So I, I'd always go, and even if I had another homework or something else to go through, I'd always go so I could see how he uses other kind of knowledge of, of physics or something else, and he applies it into, you know, math problems. So that's what okay. I, you know, one of the tips I had, yeah. Yeah, I recall that uh, in, in my calculus one and three, the professor would say, I want the answer in this form. And so you had to do a lot of manipulation, you know, divide or multiply both sides. And so if you don't understand what you do to one side of the of the, of the equal sign, you have to do to the right side, uh, you can quickly not have the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, you know, uh, just some, you know, you know, these are just very fundamental things that, you know, can get you tripped up very easily. Yeah. Uh, understanding um, tr trigonometric identities, okay? Uh, cosine of zero, one, you know, it, it's a simplicity game, but if you don't know your trigonometry very well, uh, you can go off into the weeds, you know, trying to answer those kind of questions. So uh, it was just an observation that I made, that, you know, again, it goes back to understanding your fundamentals before you start yeah. moving on. Uh, the really second thing, yeah. Uh, the second thing is, uh, you know, I'm uh, the different, uh, you know, the derivatives and all that uh, in uh, electronics. We use that quite a bit. And uh, interesting enough, you know, the equal side. Sometimes people don't understand the equal side. Says it's a balanced equation. Left side equals the right side, so it's balanced. But many times in engineering, you're trying to make something bigger than you know making imbalance you know like for example uh i, I can give you an example of a, a resistor you know we do the calculations uh we come up with equals uh, uh 50 50 ohms but we want it bigger than 50 ohms so we have to make the equation say greater than 50 ohms and so you you uh, do the calculations and yeah. um that's something else that you have to be aware of that 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 equal sign is only when you're trying to balance you know both sides equally, but many times you want it to go this way. <laughs> uh, but uh, very good presentation. I appreciated that. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you. So now it's time for Jose uh, Martin to present the integrals part. Thank you, guys. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to put my screen right now. Um, okay. Second. Uh, there. <clears throat> okay, so hello guys. My name is Jose Martin. My major is in industrial engineering. I come from the same university as Ana Maria and Jeremy. I'm from UTEC. Uh, obviously, I'm Peruvian too. Um, okay, so we're going to learn integrals today with me. So <clears throat> to put it simply, we can first assume that integrals are just uh, 
the opposite of the uh, of derivation you know so here i have a there's a set of, of, of functions that i'm showing to you they all have one thing in common they have um, one of one of its components it is x squared but they are they are different because they they have different constants uh, in addition to them but as as you may know if we derivate each of these functions we will get the same result which is two times x so based on this concept we can understand that one function when integrated can have many different results so this is what we call an indefinite integral <clears throat> which means that the integral of a function can be any of, an, of the possible antiderivatives of this function plus a real constant that has that should not have anything to do with the variable itself so it has to be a real constant that doesn't have the, the letter x involved in it so as long as the <clears throat> derivation of this antiderivative equals to the function that that we we we've been working on in, in the first place so this is the first idea that we have uh, of integrals. But you might ask yourselves, so, OK, integration is the opposite of derivation. But why do I need to do this? What, what does this mean? What, what is the use for this? So let me, you, let me propose you guys a question. So let's say that we have uh, this function. This is a very simple uh, function. It's a x squared. And we're going to plot it from zero to two and i'm going to ask you the question what is the area below this curve so i want to uh find out what is the area that is below this line so this this whole region i i want to know sorry i want to know what is uh, the area of this whole region so how can i do that if i just know basic uh, geometric concepts you know i know how to calculate the area of a triangle of a rectangle but i don't i don't really know how to do this with with this curve because this is this is not really a, a circle isn't it right so since i i don't know the same question was uh, pondered many many years ago by some very famous mathematicians and one of them uh, called riemann <coughs> proposed that we should divide the area below the curve in rectangles and he said uh if we if we start using more and more rectangles the shape the because if as you can see if we use just one three or five rectangles we don't really have uh that the shape that they take is not is, isn't really the same as the as the area that we're trying to, to calculate uh right but if we start using more and more rectangles up to an infinitesimal point, uh, we will get very, very close or we will reach the, the limit in, in which we can safely calculate or, or assume that the area calculated by adding the, the areas of these very, very thin rectangles will, will become the, the area that we're trying to calculate, right? So later, uh, Newton and Leibniz developed this concept and they came up with this expression that is known as the Newton-Leibniz axiom, and which is the basis for the uh, definite integrals. So it says that as long as we know the start and end, end point of this function, we can calculate its area <clears throat> by integrating from point A to point B the function uh, in X. Uh, this means that we're working the integral uh, in X just by evaluating the antiderivative of this function in the by the upper bound and then subtract it by the lower bound. So <clears throat> what does this mean? I, I'm going to explain you very quickly what does this mean. Uh, this is the symbol for integration. And based on what we just saw uh, on, on the model proposed by Riemann, <clears throat> We just, I just want you guys to know that this is just a, a big S, a, a, an elongated S, because integration is nothing more than uh, an infinite sum. So we're just uh, adding adding things up until we get uh, to a result. Okay. 
so if we start uh, understanding integral as, as just a, a big sum, I think that that's going to be make, make things a lot easier. So going back to the question that was that I initially proposed is what is the area below this curve? So we're going to use the the two uh, concepts that we just learned to to do this. So in order to calculate the area, we know that the function that we're going to be working on is x squared. So using the first concept, which is the concept of uh, integration being the opposite of uh, derivation, we're going to calculate the antiderivative for this function. So what we're going to do is apply this small rule with this very, very easy and basic rule, which says that <clears throat> whatever we have uh, as, as an exponent for x, we just have to add 1. Remember that in derivation, we had to subtract one. OK, so in integration, we have to add one and then divide the whole expression by the new exponent that we got. That we got. So since we're working with a two here, uh, we're going to apply this and we're going to add one. So this becomes an x cubed. And then we're going to we're going to divide this by three. So we have an x cubed uh, over three plus the real constant that it can be any number that, that we want as long as it, it doesn't have the x involved in it. OK, so the antiderivative is just that expression without the constant. OK, so x cubed over 3. So in order to calculate the area, and since we already know the antiderivative for this function, we just use the newton leibniz axiom, and we evaluate uh, the antiderivative on the upper bound and then subtract it by the lower bound. So see, this is a, a very simple example. And we just plug the, the numbers in on this function, and we get uh, 2 cubed over 3 subtracted by 0 cubed or, over 3. So the result that we're going to get is 2.666 uh, to infinity. But <clears throat> this is uh, like the, the most basic use for, for integration. And actually, this question, like how to find the area below the curve, is the, the, the one that sparked this, this whole concept. And, and we can delve so much deeper into this. So we're going to jump right now into a, a, a slightly more difficult problem. So this is actually a, a, a problem used in my in my university for Calc 1. This is a, a test problem for the summer semester, if, if I remember well. So what does it say? It says that in a club, a run will be built uh, with the following dim dimensions. OK, so they, give, they already give us this graph. And it says the lateral space available must be used for advertising. So what is the maximum possible profit if advertisement companies pay $105 per square meter available? So we know that this curve is described by this function, which is already provided to us. Um, there is a, small, a smaller uh, ramp here that we're not going to be, uh, be able to use for, for advertisement. So if we, know, if we use the concept of integrals as the calculation of an area below the curve, we can easily do this problem. So first, we have to put our problem in context, OK? So whatever they ask us to do, we have to identify um, which mathematical principle we're going to use to solve this. OK, so since they are talking about areas and we have curves, okay, curves below the area means we're going to integrate. So <clears throat> since we're only using the area on the side, uh, we're going to calculate the large area which is uh, the area highlighted in in yellow and we're then we're going to subtract it by the area painted in green which is the small area described by this uh, straight line so <clears throat> the revenue which is the the what we're trying to find out we, because we know we want to make uh, a profit out of this wall is going to be 105 dollars times the area that that we're going to calculate so the this area is going to be equal to the large area subtracted by the small area. And as we as we already know, uh, <clears throat> because we already know in integrals, uh, the large area is going to be the integral from 0 to 4 of this function, which is 1 over 2 plus 7 over 4 times x squared plus 2. And the small area is going to be the integration from 0 to 1 of this line, which we don't know the, the equation for yet. So the first thing that we have to do is to calculate the equation of the of this straight line. And this is very easy to do. We, we, since we already have uh, some points plotted out, plotted out for us, we just use the two-point strategy. So 
we pick any two any two points uh, belonging to this uh, line and that's enough information to calculate uh, the equation of this of this line so the first point is going to be zero uh, on x and 1.5 on y and the second point is going to be one on x and 0 0.5 uh, on y so we just plug this uh, on the <clears throat> on this equation, which is y equals uh, the slope times x plus the independent term, and we find out that 1.5 equals the slope multiplied by uh, by zero plus the independent term. Then, using the first equation, we find out that the independent term is going to be 1.5, and then using the second point, uh, which is 1.0.5. Uh, we find out that 0 0.5 equals the slope multiplied by 1 plus the independent term. Since we already know it, we just put it right there, which is 1.5, and we find out that the slope is actually negative 1. And we can clearly see that it is a negative slope because the line is going downwards. So therefore, the equation for our uh, line is going to be negative x plus 1.5. We already have a function of the of the line. We can we are now able to calculate the small area. So we're just going to solve the uh, integral. We go from zero to one, and this is the function that we're gonna uh, that we're gonna integrate. <clears throat> so uh, remember the rule that that I just showed you. Uh, x is a uh, <clears throat> x is already it, it has a has a potency of of one. So what we must do is just add one to, to the one that is invisible here, and we get, get a two. So we get an x squared over two because we, we also have to divide it by the exponent. So we have a negative x squared over two, and then we add uh, <clears throat> uh, 1.5 times x. Any constant that we integrate, uh, we can assume it's, it's multiplied by the, the, by the variable, which is x, to the potency of zero because x to the zero is one. So if we have x to the zero, we just add one and we get x to the one, which is just x. And we evaluate this function in both the upper bound, which is one, and the lower bound, which is zero. How do we do this? We just uh, plug this in, plus plug this value in, and we get negative one squared uh, over two plus 1.5. And then we subtract it by the same expression, but evaluated in, in, in zero. So it's negative zero squared uh, over two plus 1.5 times zero. So <clears throat> this whole expression, we can just get rid, rid of it because it's just zero. And we find out that the small area is actually just one square meter. See, so super easy. So since we have the small area, we're gonna calculate now the large area. So in order to do this, we're gonna use a neat little trick uh, it, 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 this is actually a very cool uh, technique, which is called a uh, uh, trigonometric substitution. So I'm, I'm going to go into it right now. So <clears throat> this is the expression that we're going to uh, we're going to integrate now. It's uh, we have to go from zero to four for the function that was given to us, which is uh, one over two uh, plus seven over four times x squared plus two. <clears throat> So uh, the, the first term is like very easy to integrate. It's just x x over 2 because it's a constant and we just multiply by, by x. But the second one uh, goes to uh, <clears throat> to do the sec in order to do the second one, we have to use this technique which we call uh, trigonometric substitution. We cannot use the, the basic technique that I, uh, I taught you a few slides ago because <clears throat> This is a division, and the x is in the on the denominator, and on top of that, it, it is a, it is a squared. So there's no really any way to to put this back in or, or back on top of the of the division uh, without ha without how without having to do to do something with this uh, two. So <clears throat> what I want you to uh, tell you guys here is that the important part is not that that you really have to memorize. Uh, the whole procedure for a trigonometric substitution. What is important is that you have to uh, begin to understand and identify the structures or the, the patterns that are going to be shown, shown to you and that are going to straight away tell you which uh, integration technique is going to be the, better, the, the best one for, for the, every situation. So whenever I see a division, when I have the, the variable squared, 
I already know that I have to apply this technique, which is uh, trigonometric substitution. So how are you going to do this? Okay, so first we're gonna draw a right, uh, right triangle. Mm -hmm. And okay, uh, in in the on the hypotenuse we're gonna put the denominator uh, a square rooted. Okay, so we have the square root of four times x squared plus two, <clears throat> and on each cathed I'm going to put uh, each term uh, a square rooted. So on on one side I'm going to put I don't think, I don't think it's very clear here, but I'm putting two times x on the on the right on the cathed opposite opposite to to this angle, and uh, on the adjacent cathode, I'm going to put the square root of two. So, <clears throat> actually, I just separated this uh, uh, expression here, and I uh, I called it i because I'm, I'm just going to work on on this one for now. So, <clears throat> we're going to give it the, the proper shape. So, we we took the seven away. Uh, so we have seven times the uh, integral of one over four times x squared plus two. Uh, in respect to x, <clears throat> and we're going to do that trigonometric substitution. So theta is going to be the arc or the angle which whose tangent is going to equal 2 times x over the square root of 2. So the tangent of theta, which is the, the variable that we're going to re be replacing x for, is going to be 2 times x over the square root of 2. So then we just multiply the whole thing uh, by the square root of 2, and we get that 2 times x equals to the square root of 2 multiplied by the tangent of theta. And then we can safely derivate this in order to, to also replace the, the um, <coughs> differential term. And we get that 2 times the, the derivative of x is going to be the square root of 2 multiplied by uh, the the, the square secant of theta multiplied by the derivative of theta. So we replace <clears throat> this term two times x here because this is four times x squared equals to two times x squared. And we're just gonna uh, put it right here. And we're going to also replace uh, the derivative of x as the square root of two divided by two multiplied by the square secant of theta uh, by the div, uh, derivative of theta, of theta. So that's what we have right here. So <clears throat> this is very important. We have to remember our, our, our trigonometric identities. <clears throat> we have to know that two times the, uh, the tangent squared of theta plus uh, one equals to the squared secant. So actually, this whole thing we can fact we can factorize the two in this denominator and we can uh, cancel it out with a, a square secant that we have right here. So we end up with just seven times the integral of the square root of two divided by four of the differential of theta, which equals to the seven times the uh, sorry seven seven times the square root of two uh, divided by four by the uh, into integral of the differential of theta. And the integral of, uh, of the differentiation of the differential of any variable, it's just going to be the variable because that's the anti-derivative. So in the end, this expression is going to be seven times uh, the square root of two divided by four multiplied by theta. But we know that theta is already the, the arctangent of two times x divided by the square root of two. And that's how we plug it in right here. So we have the, the whole expression. Uh, actually, um, yes, the, the, same, the same numbers. Um, well, but they're, they're expressed in a different way here, sorry. Uh, multiplied by the arctangent of the square root of uh, square root of two multiplied by x. And then we just do the same evaluation. We evaluate this uh, by the upper bound and we subtract it by the lower one, which is zero. So in order to calculate the revenue, we end up calculating the, the second area, the large area. So we just plug it in this whole function. We, we plug it in the, the four, and then we plug it in the, the zero. And this is what we get. Uh, <clears throat> this is the whole expression that we get. Actually, again, the, the part that, the, that is applied to zero just cancels out because <clears throat> the 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 arc which is whose tangent equals to zero because the square root of two multiplied by zero is zero. 
is actually just zero because it's a, a very very small angle like <clears throat> because the larger the larger the angle you have the uh, a bigger tangent so if we if you have, if your tangent is zero then that means your angle is also zero okay so we just get rid of this whole thing and we can actually just calculate this and we we end up with uh, approximately 3.45 square meters so the total area is going to be uh, 3.45, 45 uh, subtracted by the small area, which is just one. And then we just multiply the values, which are, are going to be uh, 105 times the area, uh, and we get the, the final result or the maximum uh, available profit. Okay, so as you can see, uh, <clears throat> actually the, the, the algebraic part wasn't really that hard, as long as you remember the, uh, like your trigonometric identities. So, <clears throat> yeah, okay, that's pretty much it. So I don't know if you guys have, have any questions. <clears throat> no, that was great, Jose. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I think we're going to segue directly to Gerardo because we're a little bit behind and we want to be mindful of everyone's time. So Gerardo is going to do the logistic curve, and um, Jose, can you please stop uh, presenting so sure, Gerardo sure. can uh, follow? Thank you, guys. Okay, done. No. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Gerardo. I'm going to start presenting right now. Okay. So there it is, right? Okay. Uh, first of all, I I wanted to, uh, to talk about myself for a little bit. Um, I'm 42 years old. I've been married for um, seven years now. I have a a couple of twins who are going to be three on January, and who are a little bit uh, stressed from because of the lockdown, right? Anyway, um, the, their behavior <laughs> is, is kind of uh, a misbehavior, but, uh, well, that's, that's going to pass, right? <clears throat> uh, right now, I'm going to, to, to talk to you about an application of, of, of a derivative of a function, uh, which is the logistic curve, okay? <clears throat> okay, that's, that's the plane. And uh, I, I want you to take a look at this chart here, okay? Uh, I took this chart from the John Hopkins, Hopkins University <coughs> um, data, okay? This is the, this is the, the website. I, I, I got this chart. They, they give us the number of cases of, of coronavirus in different places, in different places around the world, right? Different countries. Um, for example, for example, we have a, an orange curve right here, right? The orange curve uh, tells us about the number of cases of coronavirus in India, right? See how this is this is behaving. See how this curve is behaving. Around uh, June, probably, the number of cases began to grow very fast, right? began to grow very fast <clears throat> until one point, uh, maybe around September. Of course, the number of cases uh, continued to grow, but, but not, as, not as fast as before, right? So the, the, the speed at which the number of cases grew uh, decayed a little bit. <clears throat> anyway, uh, right now, this curve seems to be st stabilized, kind of, right? Okay, let's take a look at another curve. For example, this curve right here, which is from Brazil. The behavior is, is very similar, right? The behavior is, is very similar in a way that uh, at first, the number of cases were, were increasing very rapidly, but at some point, that speed began to decay. And uh, I mean, uh, even though the number of cases continue to grow, uh, it is not doing it as as, as fast as, as before, right? 
Okay, uh, so all these curves have kind of the same behavior, right? Kind of the same behavior. Um, maybe maybe the, the green curve for the US has a kind of an, an erratic behavior if you compare it to the rest, but uh, it's more or less the same, okay? So we're going to talk about um, a model, a mathematician model that tries to uh, explain or predict what 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 happens with with this kind of curves so this function right here uh, is called a, lo a logistic function and its graph is called a logistic curve okay this is a logistic curve okay this is the graph of a function of this type here okay from geogebra i i uh, picked some values for the constants a b and k which which are all uh, positive constants, okay? And let's see how those constants, um, or, or let's see what, what the value of those constants make to the graph, okay? Um, let me, let me share with you uh, this, this function right here, okay? Here we have the, the function I talked to you about, right? This is the logistic function. And uh, now let's see what happens when when B changes, okay? As you can see, the B, when B changes, well, uh, simply the, 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 the function, the, the, the green curve uh, goes up, right? The, the bigger B is, the, the taller the, or the higher the, the function gets, right? Uh, if you look closely, if you look closely, <clears throat> actually the value of B is an, an upper bound for the for the green function, for the logistic function, okay? So uh, if, B, if B is four, then it means that the curve at, at the long term is going to, to get uh, closer and closer to, to that value, okay? Of course, it, it's never going to be greater than, than that, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's what happens when, when B changes, okay? What happens when, oh, okay, I'm going to set it to B equals 4. What happens when A changes? As you can see, as A changes, what changes in the curve is uh, the value of, of the function evaluated in zero, right? That's what happens when, when, we, when we change the value of A. What changes is F evaluated in zero. Okay? So the, the initial value, let's call it like that, the initial value of F depends on the value of A. And when K changes, sorry, when K changes, what changes is how fast is how fast is uh, the function increasing at first? Okay, so that's what so that's what uh, a, b, and k um, do to this function, right? Okay, let's take a look at this stationary curve here. <clears throat> so uh, for b, for the value of, of three comma five uh, for b, we have that the curve is never bigger than that. Right, that is an, an upper bound for for that function. When a equals five, well, f of zero becomes uh, this value here that is approximately uh, zero comma six. And when k equals zero comma four, well, uh, the curve increases like this. Right? <clears throat> okay. Um, so as I was saying, this curve is very similar to to the curves that we that we were seeing for the coronavirus, a number of cases of coronavirus, it turns out that uh, this function helps us model uh, the spreading of diseases. Okay, let's take a look at this here. It models uh, pandemics, right? It models uh, population growth. Okay, uh, actually, the, the this function was uh, found out by by a French scientist who was trying to model population growth. Uh, it, it also models rumor propagation, right? Fake news. Uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard all about that, right? It also models uh, how rumors and fake news uh, 
grow. Okay, and this is, these are the observations that we were uh, making uh, before, right? F of zero depends on B and A, like this. That's not, not uh, hard to see. We just have to evaluate F in zero. Then we hey, Gerardo, sorry to interrupt you. It seems like uh, Alexi had her hand raised. I think she has a question. Alexi, do you have any question? Yes, please. Questions, questions. Oh, no, I probably did that on accident. My bad, you guys. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, continue, Gerardo. Sorry about that. Okay, no problem. So, as I was saying, f of zero, we can see that here, when x is zero, then the exponential becomes uh, one, and we would have p over one plus a, right? And as I was saying, the limit of f at infinity would be uh, b, right? Because this exponential here uh, is actually a denominator. It becomes zero when x is, uh, or when, when x goes to infinity, right? <clears throat> So we only get b over one, which is b. Okay. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about the derivative of of a function and what it tells us about f, right? Well, you 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 have seen uh, you have seen how to derivate this kind of function, right? Uh, we can rewrite it as b times this parenthesis uh, to the power of negative one. Right. So in order to derivate it, we just have to um, put this negative uh, down here. It turns into a negative two and multiply it times the derivative of the parenthesis. Right. Um, which is uh, basically a, an exponential function. Right. So the derivative of one is zero. The derivative of the exponential would be the, the same exponential times the derivative of the exponent, which is a negative pk, right? <clears throat> so there it is. That's the, the derivative of f, and we can rewrite it like this, okay? Now, what we have here is um, the graph of f and the graph of its derivative, right? The green curve, we you already saw it, right? Um, as I was saying, B is is an upper bound for for that curve. It's called the carrying capacity, right? When we're talking about uh, when we're talking about population, <clears throat> um, there's always uh, constraints, right? Uh, maybe lack of nutrients or or lack of space that <clears throat> make the population. <clears throat> I'm sorry, that make the population not not grow infinity of course when we're talking about uh the, the propagation of a virus of course it, it it will only affect susceptible people right maybe people that are unvaccinated etc right <clears throat> well as i was saying the the red function that we have here is the the its derivative and it has an extreme point right it has an extreme point that happens when x equals 1 comma 15 approximately, right? <clears throat> okay, so when x equals 1 comma 15, f prime as an extreme point, okay? And what's the, what's the effect of that point for f, right? What happens here? What happens when we evaluate f in that point where, where f prime is extreme? <clears throat> well, let, let's see what happens, right? That's the question that I make here, right? When when does f prime reach its maximum? Where that where does that uh, one comma fifteen come from? And what's the value of f at that time? <clears throat> so in order to 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 get that one comma fifteen, in order to to know where f prime reaches its maximum, we have to derivate it, right? <clears throat> so when we derivate uh, f prime, we get the second derivative of f. <clears throat> uh, it's a kind of a long process, so I just wrote it here. This is the second derivative of f. And in order for that to be zero, this parenthesis here has to be zero, okay? Because a, b, and k are positive constant, 
and uh, the exponential never gets to be zero, right? So the parenthesis has to be zero, and from that we get x, right? It turns out that that the, the derivative of x will be will be zero when x equals the natural log of a over b k. So for these values of a, b, and k, <clears throat> that happens to be one comma fifteen, right? And when we evaluate f at 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 that point, we get we get uh, a, a simple number, right? A simple value for for f. It's b over two. <clears throat> so uh, this is the uh, the graph. This is the graph. So we know that b is an upper bound. It turns out that uh, the, this extreme for f prime happens when exactly when when the function when the function gets to be b over two. Okay, that's the halfway to get to the carrying capacity. Uh, feel free to to ask any questions uh, while I'm uh, while I'm explaining all of this. Okay, uh, we're going to we're going to end this presentation with an an easy example. Okay, it says here uh, public health uh, records indicate that two weeks after the outbreak of a certain form of influenza, approximately Q thousand people had caught the disease. Uh, how many people had the disease when it broke out? How many had it two weeks later? Um, at what time does the rate of infection begin to decline? And if the trend continues, approximately how many people will eventually contract the disease? Okay, so uh, first of all, how many people had the disease when it broke out? Then we just have to <coughs> we just have to evaluate Q in t equals zero. We already saw it was b over one plus a. If you don't remember that, <coughs> never mind. You're just evaluating the function here, e to the zero equals one. So we get twenty over one plus nineteen, which is one. Right? This means that a thousand people, a thousand people were sick when the disease broke out. Right? And then how many had it two weeks later? Then we just have to evaluate q in and t equals two and then we get this here right this means that uh, 7343 people uh, are going to be sick in, in two weeks from now right or two weeks after it broke out <clears throat> uh, then at what time does the rate of infection begin to decline uh, that means that means when the derivative of q in this case uh, reaches its maximum, right? Because that's when it begins to decline. Okay, so we already know the answer to that is the natural log of a over bk. In this case, it would be uh, 2.454, right? So uh, that means that um, that means that after two and a half weeks, more or less, after two and a half weeks. Uh, the, the rate of change of, of, of this function here begins to decline, right? So the disease slows down, okay? <clears throat> it also means that the, the number of, of people infected uh, gets to be half of what is going to be, right, eventually. And uh, finally, if trend continues, how many people will eventually contract the disease? Well, that's that's b, right? That's the limit of q at infinity, and we all know that, or we already saw it. It was just b, right? The the number that that comes up here. So the answer would be that eventually, twenty thousand people uh, are going to catch this. Okay. Uh, so this is this is what I uh, prepared for you guys. I hope you found it interesting. <coughs> Uh, right now, we're going to we're going to go to um, Gabriel. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Gerardo. It was really interesting. Does anyone have any question, commentary, or anything, uh, George or Allison? 
Uh, no, I, I, I was just going to say it's, uh, it's been very fascinating, interesting, and uh, uh, kind of a revisit of uh, some of my old classes. <laughs> so uh, appreciate the uh, excellent information. Perfect. So, um, sorry, uh, people screaming here. So um, we just wanted to like basically announce the raffle and then um, Eduardo Hojas from Loomis Engineering is going to like in introduce the externship program with, um, with Papaya. So Eduardo, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, well, we can wait one second for Sandra. I'm just going to show um, something, hold on. Sure. Okay, hold on. Okay. Sorry, it's it's a lot here. So yeah, so we were looking at all the people that were in the chat, and uh, basically uh, we're going to draw one person that won the raffle today. Uh, we'll reach out to you by email. Um, so we'll uh, announce it now. So Melissa um, from um, basically Melissa from um, from FIU, you're going to win. Uh, the raffle today. We're going to reach out to you. Thank you for tuning in. We saw that you commented before and you reach out to us today. So thank you for joining. We're excited to send you all your gift and thank you for sticking to the end. So basically, Eduardo, do you want to kind of like um, introduce uh, what's the externship, what is going on there and what are you looking for? And please tell us more about Loomis Automation. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for having me. I want to have. Uh, I want to thank Sandra and Papaya team for putting all this together. And George it feels uh, amazing being a part of uh, this team. Um, yeah. So really quickly, um, just a quick introduction. My name is Eduardo. I am a mechanical engineer for, um, from Chico State. I graduated in 2014, and uh, I am the founder of Loomis Automation. One of the founders. Uh, my other partner couldn't be here today. His name is Brett. Um, and I'm also the founder of Engineering Memes Guy, which is a, a meme page on Instagram. For those who don't know about it, uh, go look for us, uh, Loomis Automation and at Engineering Memes Guy. So yeah, today I'm, I'm excited to announce the externship program that we're doing here in, in uh, Orange, California. Um, for those who don't know what an externship is, it's, a, <clears throat> it's, it's like an internship, but shorter in time. And uh, what we're trying to do here is just give people practical experience where they can at least add some experience in their resume. Um, so right now we've had, uh, I want to say about 10 interns this year, and they've all gone to different companies like Northrop Grumman, um, you know, Raytheon, stuff like uh, companies like that. So we're pretty happy that they've gotten uh, dream jobs for them. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so a little bit about Loomis too. Um, we do industrial automation. So what that entails is we get into machine design, we get into electrical controls, uh, motion control, um, and software integration. As you can imagine, machines require um, a lot of pieces and uh, it's not just physical pieces, but also the software side of things and making everything um, work. Um, you know, one of these videos that they're showing here is uh, we're filling um, uh, some vials and uh, we pretty much created the machine from scratch, did a lot of research. Um, so we do a lot of things like that uh, here at Loomis. And uh, really, our goal is to drive the uh, automation revolution. Um, we we're, we get into many different fields right now. We get into medical field, aerospace field, even you know the cannabis industry is keeping us really busy, uh, even military projects. Um, so with, with what we do, we can get into pretty much all aspects of machinery and, and automation processes. <clears throat> Feel free to ask any questions if anybody has them. And, uh, and for those wondering what type of talent we're looking for, uh, mainly, well, right now we we have uh, mechatronic students uh, that we are looking for mechatronic students uh, that are passionate about automation. Um, 
also mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and people that like uh, to program. So if you guys are into programming, we also do that here. Um, yeah, I mean, we actually have a slide. A we have a slide on mm -hmm. information. Uh, so if you can go up on that slide, uh, Gab, I think it's a previous slide. Um, Mm -hmm. It's uh, about the externships. I think it's that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we added a slide to to name all the majors, and then um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So the you know the reason why we really care about this externship, and I'm sorry, I was in like a work call. Um, so the reason why we we care about this externship program is because we want to, you know, like we care about minorities and underrepresented communities. And we know it's so important to put something on your resume. It is known that a lot of like people of color don't graduate with an internship. So an externship is a perfect opportunity for you to showcase your talents, put it on your resume, and, you know, um, maybe even get a, a real job uh, at Loomis. I know these guys are amazing. Uh, do you, okay. And, you know, I actually worked in the uh, in the shop with, uh, with Eduardo, they're very excited. And it's, you know, it's very cool, Eduardo. I don't know, um, like I said, I was in a work call. Um, so I don't know what I miss here, but uh, Eduardo comes from Chico State and his partner comes from Purdue University. So they're both very smart and very passionate, and they really care about helping our, our communities, our students, about empowering us. And they want to show you, hey, are you a mechanical student, but maybe you want to switch to electrical? Like that way you can, you know, you can actually taste like what you're studying and see if you actually like it or if you want to switch majors, you know, it, it is important. Your your happiness is important to us. Um, mm -hmm. we're announce the real the real um opportunity well not the real opportunity but we're going to send an official communication on january 15 about the extension programs but for now you can send your resume to info at lumisautomation.com and and yeah i know that you know he cares about helping we're all here for each other and we just want to make sure that you know we do anything we can to help our students so so yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything else, uh, Eduardo. Yeah, let me. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, you brought up a point about people changing majors, right? And that actually has happened here, where somebody thought he wanted to do like a mechanical, and because of everything that we're doing, he actually changes major to mechatronic. So um, people are definitely making life decisions here, like changing their life, and they're choosing, you know, a path based on what they're seeing here. So it's pretty pretty cool to be able to influence people that way, and um, and it's you know if, if they like it, then it's easy for them to stick around and you know help out. And uh, right now we're we're not doing paid internships right now, but um, uh, we do give people time to uh, gain experience and then become valuable. We have like a three month program as well, where uh, after that time we can we can. You know, start paying people yeah exciting and you know he actually looks like he just graduated college so i think <laughs> it's pretty cool that you know like they took that leap of faith and they opened their own company and you know we like really young entrepreneurs here so so yeah that's pretty cool um okay well i would like to let you go to bed or go watch your favorite netflix show Thank you so much for attending. Um, Gabrielle, Eduardo, I would really like you guys to say thank you too because you know you so much work on this. So uh, so yeah, so I mean this um, Gabrielle and Eduardo have worked so hard on this. Um, so thank you to you guys. And I really hope that this uh, calculus workshop can help you, uh, you know, go make the best um, out of your calculus finals if you have any um tutor needs or you know like if you have any questions don't hesitate to 
to message us through Instagram. You can request a tutor. We'll give you free codes so you can uh, you can also you know get prepared with one on one tutoring lessons. I know that I'm working with other chapters to make more workshops for you guys. So don't hesitate to reach out. We're we're here to help, and I'm very excited to to be part of your college journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, all of you guys. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, George and Allison. Yeah, George. You're the best. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our tutors too. Thank My you. Pleasure. Have a good night, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. guys. Bye. Thank you. See you.